You're recognized. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for including me in this hearing and for yielding your time. I want to start by saying some names, some names that we all should be saying every minute of every day, and they're just a few. Delana Ashley Yan, Paul Andre Michaels, Jaje Yan, Dao Yu Feng, Elsias Hernandez Ortiz, Julie Park, Hyun Jung Park. These were people who were murdered in Georgia just a couple of days ago. And Mr. Chairman, I would just say as an Indian immigrant woman, the first South Asian American elected to the House of Representatives, the violence and discrimination targeting the Asian American community hits very close to home. And it's been a difficult hearing, an important hearing, but a very difficult hearing for many of us. Shortly after 9-11, I founded One America, Washington State's largest immigrant rights group, initially to fight back against backlash targeting Muslim, Sikh, and South Asian communities. Back then, it was Balbir Singh Sodhi, who was murdered on, August, on September 15, 2001, in Mesa, Arizona. He was shot five times by a man who just, quote, wanted to kill a Muslim, a man who said, as he was arrested, I stand for America all the way. Mr. Chairman, there is no question that our words matter, our framing matters, and particularly as members of Congress, when we use our platforms to continue slurs that are seen in a way that encourages racist hate crimes, it is a big problem. Just recently in a committee hearing, some of my colleagues across the aisle continue to call it the China virus. I spoke up, I said that was, uh, that, that was not correct language, number one, and number two, it incited this kind of hate. And yet my colleagues continued to use that language. And now here we are continuing to see a huge surge in hate crimes and violence targeting in particular, most recently, Asian women. I wanna start with you, Professor Motomura. How does the history of racist laws that promoted distrust towards Asian Americans influence the hate we are seeing today? Well, I mean, those influences are very profound. Uh, we start with the Chinese exclusion era. It's, a, it's, it's exclusion, uh, as we've heard today, uh, exclusion of Asian immigrants, uh, large, uh, most Asian immigrants, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Chinese immigrants uh, started in 1882. It, it prevails for 60 years. It stunts the growth of the Chinese American community. Uh, and we have uh, severe restrictions on Asian immigration, formal restrictions until 1965. I mean, I feel as I mentioned, my testimony is very strongly because my fam own family was one of the few families uh, that managed to get to the United States during that period. And so we joined a community that really didn't exist uh, at that time of uh, my, 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 uh, my parents' uh, contemporaries. Um, and so, you know, these are, these, are, these are things that you carry with you for your whole life. Um, I remember a lot of the sorts of incidents that we're talking about today um, being, uh, having close calls and those sorts of things. This is a long time ago, but these are things that we see uh, from, from those laws. I think we've seen this with regard to the, uh, the ban uh, that was imposed on uh, Muslim countries uh, that prevailed over the last four years. And I think that's, that's not exactly, um, entirely what we're talking about today, but I think it's pretty closely related. So I think that a lot of this um, is something that um, prevails over time. I mean, this is not something that is limited to uh, a five-year period, a 10-year period, but I think we're still seeing effects, as we've seen today, of um, anti-Chinese laws that took, uh, took effect in 1875 and 1882. Thank you, Professor. Professor Sinar, you have written about 9-11 and the discriminatory laws and policies against Asian American, Arab, Muslim, and Sikh communities that came after. Do you believe that there's a strategy behind demonizing these groups in times of crisis and fear? And so thank you for your comments uh, and your question to me, Representative Jaikal. What happened after 9-11 is that the government undertook a number of dragnet immigration programs that treated entire communities as threats. So hundreds of immigrants were detained on the basis of their race and ethnicity without any individual basis for suspicion. 25 Muslim countries, uh, their citizens were subject to special registration, uh, fingerprinting and interrogation. And all of this sent the message that Muslim, Arab and South Asian communities were disloyal and threatening. 
Um, so, in, and the lesson here is that in times of geopolitical tension and security fears, it's especially important for the government to avoid stigmatizing entire communities uh, because it does lead to uh, greater violence and discrimination, both in the, the public sphere as well as in government policy directly. Thank you. I, I just want to say I, I hope that my colleagues understand their words matter and we need everyone's help in fighting back against these racist attacks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back.